Good. I'm uh, Jack Galley. I'm here with my uh, partners. Kevin Martinez. And Max Davidson. And this is our Physics 212 project, pro problem one. For our uh, problem description, we chose problem one. Uh, the system of problem one consists of a frictionless turntable with a block of mass M placed a distance of big R from the center. The block has a string attached that goes towards a massless pulley in the center where the string goes down through the center of the turntable attaches to a ball of mass little m and radius r that hangs freely. With this information, our group is tasked with finding the angular velocity of the turntable. In our assumptions portion, the first and greatest assumption we have is that in this system, there is no sort of frictional or regular force that is going to degrade our experiment the point that it'll affect our theoretical outcomes. Uh, the way I like to put it is that just everything should stand true to our theory and we shouldn't have any irregularities that are going to affect this experiment. And our second assumption, the angular velocity of the block is equal to the angular velocity of the turntable. And our final assumption is that there is no slip or stretch in our string attached to the ball. Moving into our formulas and known, vari known variables and important laws, uh, our first formula is torque net, which is equal to our moment of inertia times our angular acceleration, our torque, which is our radius cross our force, our force, which is equal to mass times acceleration, our tangential acceleration, which is equal to our velocity squared over our radius, our angular acceleration, which is equal to our acceleration over our radius, our angular velocity, which is equal to our velocity over our radius. And then moving into our known variables, we have the mass of the block, the mass of the ball, uh, big R, which is the radius from the block to the center of the turntable, uh, G, which is our gravi gravitational acceleration, and then little r, which is the radius of our ball. Uh, some of the important laws for this is Newton's third law. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This just has to do with our Newton's third law force pairs that'll be used later on. And then Newton's second law, which is simply put, force is equal to mass times acceleration. All right, we went ahead and put some of these known variables into some free body diagrams, uh, one for the ball on the left and one for the block on the right. For the ball, it has little r, which is the radius of the ball, and then two forces, the force of tension that the string is exerting on the ball and the force of gravity that's acting on the center of gravity of the ball. It also has some angular acceleration, which we're going to need to find. Uh, the block on the right has mass big M, and it's got a normal force and the gravitational force and then the tension from that pulley. And it's also got some velocity that we're going to need to find as well. Uh, moving on to the extended free body diagrams, we went ahead and uh, put some more detail into the diagram that was given to us. So on the left, we have the block on the turntable. Uh, you can see its forces. And one big thing to highlight is the two tension forces, which are equal, and the radius big R, which is the radius of that turntable. And on the right is the, a top-down view of the turntable. You got the block on the left and you can see the angle velocity that we're trying to find. For the solution, we first started with solving for the torque of the ball. For that, we looked up the uh, moment of inertia for a, a hollow ball rotating about its uh, center axis, which was 2 thirds mass of the ball times the radius of the ball squared. Then we use that with our net torque equation, which is the moment of inertia times angular acceleration is equal to the torque of uh, felt from the tension on the pulley from the pulley on the ball. That gave us the uh, equation for the radius of the ball across the force of tension. Uh, for the pulley on the ball. 
using that, we can simplify that down to the magnitude of the radius times the magnitude of the tension force felt on the ball times the sine of theta. The sine of theta is 90 degrees, which is going to go simplify down to one, which gives us our next equation of the torque of the ball is equal to the radius of the ball times the force of tension felt on the ball. And then we can take that back and simplify it down to the force of tension of the uh, felt on the ball is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration divided by the radius of the ball. And now we can use our first relationship of angular acceleration is equal to uh, the translational acceleration divided by the radius of the ball. And we can use that substitution to get the tension force on the ball is equal to the moment of inertia times acceleration divided by radius squared, which is equal to two thirds mass of the ball times the radius squared of the ball divide, uh, times the acceleration divided by radius squared and the radius squares will cancel out and we get two thirds mass times acceleration for the tension force on the ball. We can then relate that to our Newton's second law, force net is equal to mass of the ball times acceleration. Uh, and the force net is the combination of all the forces felt on the ball, which is gonna be the gravitational force minus the uh, force of tension because they're acting in opposite directions is equal to mass times acceleration. So now we know that the gravitational force is the mass times the gravitational acceleration minus two thirds mass times of the ball times the acceleration is equal to MA. And now that we have mass on both, all, both sides and each component of the equation, we can cancel out the masses. And then we can move the negative two thirds acceleration to the other side and we get that acceleration is equal to three fifths times gravity. So now we know the tension force on the ball and we can multiply it by two thirds mass times three fifths gravity and we end up with two fifths mass times gravity. And then we can use our third law uh, pairs and say that the tension force on the ball is equal to the tension force on the block. And then we get the tension force on the block is equal to two fifths mass times the gravitational acceleration. We can use our second law again to say that the net force on the block is equal to the mass of the block times acceleration and plug in our now known uh, values for those. And we get mass of the block times acceleration is equal to two fifths mass of the ball times gravitational acceleration. Then rearrange to solve for acceleration and we get uh, acceleration is two times mass of the ball times gravitational acceleration divided by five times the mass of the block. And we can use our Next relationship that says that tangen tangential acceleration is equal to velocity squared divided by the radius. So we get velocity squared divided by the radius of the block on the turntable is equal to two times mass of the ball times gravitational acceleration divided by five times mass of the block. Then we can say that velocity is equal to the square root of two times the radius of the block on the turntable times the mass of the ball times the gravitational acceleration divided by five times the mass of the block. So now we can use our final relationship and say that uh, angular, ex angular velocity is equal to velocity divided by the radius of the turntable. And then we get our final 
uh, equation for angular velocity, which is one over the radius of the turntable times the square root of two times the radius of the turntable times the mass of the ball times the gravitational acceleration divided by five times the mass of the block. All right, so going into sense making, first let's make sure that this answer we found is actually uh, angular velocity. So we're gonna look at units here. Uh, inside the square root symbol, we can cancel out our weight units of kilograms and simplify some things to get down to uh, meters over meters times seconds. And the, obviously the meters can cancel out and we're gonna get an answer of one over seconds, which makes sense because angular velocity is radians over seconds and radians isn't really a unit we can uh, quantify. So we're gonna look into changing variables now. Uh, first, we're gonna, we're gonna see what happens if we change the radius of the turntable, big R. And we can see that as uh, radius big R becomes larger, the, our angular velocity is gonna decrease. Uh, the one over R is on the outside and that's obviously gonna, as R increases, we're gonna be dividing this whole other equation by a larger number and in turn, velocity is gonna get smaller. Uh, now we can look at mass of the ball and as that gets larger, our, our angular velocity is gonna increase. This is the little m is inside the square root symbol on the top of the fraction so as that number gets bigger, uh, our velocity is going to get bigger. And the opposite happens with the mass of the block, big M. It's on the bottom of the, the fraction inside the square root symbol. So as that gets larger, we're dividing by a larger fraction, and our angular velocity is going to get smaller. OK, so reflecting on this problem, we look back at some similar problems from Studio 4, uh, specifically the spool and block problem. We looked at kind of just how a spool reacts when it's getting pulled across the line. And we see saw how those forces would react. And the uh, we went more in depth on spool drop problem, the spool drop problem from Studio 4. And that kind of understood, helped us understand the relationship between the two tensions that we saw in this problem and that specifically that they were going to be equal.